Hey everyone, I hope y'all are having a great day, and today I'll be reviewing Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. Okay, first, you guys want to hear some crap? I read Strange the Dreamer as an ebook, but I went to my library to check out Strange the Dreamer because I saw that they had it in, and then I see this. Do you see this? They took off the dust jacket. I think that's so ridiculous. Like, I get it, dust jackets are very fragile, but also the designers and the artists who make book covers spent so, so much time on that dust jacket. And here Vanderbilt is just completely disrespecting that. And also, this is not aesthetic, you know what I'm saying? But I digress. This is Strange the Dreamer by Lady Taylor. It's the first book in a duology. It's YA fantasy. The second book, Muse of Nightmares, came out pretty recently, I think. But yeah, I read Strange the Dreamer over the past week. I don't know why it took me this long to get to it. I read Lady Taylor's Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy, which looks like this, and I really enjoyed that trilogy. It's one of my all-time favorites. I also think it's just one of the best YA fantasy series that YA has to offer. I also genuinely believe that Lady Taylor has one of the most beautiful writing styles, possibly the most beautiful writing style I've ever read in all of YA. And I'd like to think that I've read a lot of YA books. But yeah, I knew people loved Strange the Dreamer. I know that I like Lainey Taylor. But still, I was surprised at how easily I fell in love with this book. I guess I'd forgotten how enchanting Lainey Taylor's writing is. It's just the most gorgeous, rich prose I've ever seen. I don't even know what I would give to be able to write with the style of Lainey Taylor. Like, it's absurd how good she is. The thing about Lainey Taylor's books is that they are very weird fantasy. Like, they're so difficult to describe. Her imagination is a place so, so, so distant from my imagination. Like, I have no idea how she comes up with these story ideas. They're so, so strange. The Dreamer. Ah. Her book concepts are just so bizarre. They're beautiful but bizarre. Strange with the Dreamer is about a forgotten city called Weep. Its real name has just been completely erased from the world's collective memory, and our main character, Laszlo, is a librarian who reads anything he can about this lost city, and he dreams of finding it one day. And that's really all I'm going to say about the plot of the book. There are huge elements that I'm not telling you about, and that's just because I find it so, so difficult to describe what's going on in this book. It's one of those things where you really have to read it to figure out what's going on. Oh, I just realized I was gonna take out my ponytail for this video. I've already filmed it, so I'm gonna roll with it. Lainey Taylor is absolutely masterful at prose, at writing prose, and also developing characters. Her characters are incredibly rich and real and likable. Her writing, like I mentioned, is a dream. But where Lady Taylor struggles, I think, is plot. She writes very, very long books, you know? This is well over 500 pages. Each of the books in the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy is very, very long. So she writes very lengthy tomes, but nothing really happens in them. I read in the acknowledgments of this book that this story she thought was initially going to be a standalone, and then she started writing it, and she was like, oh wait, this is going to be a duology. And I really do like how much detail and how much development I got in Strange the Dreamer because the connection that you build with the world and the characters is so, so strong. But in terms of plot, I understand why she would have thought this should have been a standalone. I gave this book four out of five stars. I give it four stars because it's wonderful and beautiful. It's an enchanting story about love and prejudice and mystery and magic. I did knock off a star because of its nearly non-existent plot. But the thing is, I want to credit Lainey Taylor because it's impressive to keep readers reading just for the sake of wanting to know more about the characters in the world. Like, there's not a fast-paced plot to keep people turning the pages, and yet this book has like a 4.4 rating on Goodreads, so people are clearly loving this book, they're getting through all 500 plus pages of it, and that's an accomplishment, you know? It's an accomplishment to have a book that's so mesmerizing, despite having maybe a total of like two plot points. I'm going to go into a spoiler section now, so if you haven't read Strange the Dreamer, I'd advise leaving in three, two, one. Bye, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. <sighs> Getting up is so hard. <laughs> okay, so I went back to the beginning of this book. Okay, so I went back to the beginning of this book to take my notes for this review. And it honestly shocked me when I realized just how early the timeline of this book starts. Like we see Laszlo as a kid, we see him grow up, and it still takes some time before we get to the part where he's in the library. It killed me 
when he wasn't even allowed to try to be one of Errol Fane's delegates. Like, he didn't even get to be in that examining room, that interview, or whatever the process was. He didn't even get to be there. And it killed me to see Thyron Nero, Thy Thyon? Thyon Nero? Whatever, Nero, to get in with his fake knowledge about Weep that he only knew because he read Laszlo's books. Like, wow. That was brutal. <laughs> Luckily, Laszlo got to go anyway. Seeing him so beloved by both the Ferengi, so the Outsiders, and also the Tizzerkane Warriors, it was so heartwarming. Like, Lanny Taylor is very good at making you want to root for Laszlo. So this entire story is really about Errol Fane gathering these delegates, right, taking them back to Weep, and then trying to use their expertise to fix this problem of the Citadel being directly over the city. So that's the main plotline, right? But nothing happens with that storyline. Like, we get this one instance, this one attempt of solving this problem by going up there with the silk sleighs, and that's it. We have this over 500-page book, and that main plotline is essentially abandoned in favor of these long dream sequences with Laszlo and Sarai. And it's not that I'm mad about it, I just think it's a very ballsy storytelling move, and it's something that I think only Lainey Taylor could pull off. Like, she spends all this time revealing this dynamic between Sparrow, Feral, and Ruby, and in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter that Feral and Ruby are fooling around and that Sparrow is hurt by it? Like, no, that really has nothing to do with this greater battle at hand, this battle between, you know, the citizens of Weep and the Godspawn. But for some reason, when Lainey Taylor ignores the main plotline to delve into these little side stories to develop to her side characters, it's fine. Like, it's still very enjoyable to read. When Sarai died, <sighs> I was honestly so shook because you instantly had this realization of what was going to happen next. Sarai is dead, her spirit is gonna, or like her soul, is gonna go up, Minya is gonna catch it, Minya is gonna have control over Sarai, Laszlo is gonna be in a pickle. Like now, because Laszlo loves Sarai and because Sarai is under Minya's control, Laszlo is also under Minya's control. And I have no idea how this is going to be resolved. Minya is literally rage and vengeance personified. And I feel like there's no way that she's going to change her mind. Like, I just want her to be killed, honestly, but I know, I know that that can't really happen for the sake of the story. Also, I'm not sure what would happen to the ghosts if Minya were to die. I also don't know how I feel about Sarai being a ghost. Like, trying to date a ghost when you're still a living person? <laughs> like I said, Lady Taylor's book's very bizarre. The reason I think Minya can't die is because the entire story this conflict between the citizens of Weep and the Godspawn, that could be a metaphor for so many societal tensions that we have in the present day. Like this could be a metaphor for racism or political partisanship or class. This allegory is so transferable to so many things that we see today. And Lainey Taylor is a very smart writer, right? She's very smart and I feel like she knows what she's doing. And the thing is when there are two peoples that disagree with each other, the solution cannot be to kill whoever disagrees with you. Like, even though Minya sucks so badly and I despise her, she's been wronged, you know? She's been traumatized. She has her reasons. And you can't just kill the antagonist blindly and call that a good ending. I don't know. I don't know, I just feel like Lainey Taylor has something else in store. I am really excited to see how the story wraps up in the sequel. I've admittedly already started reading Muse of Nightmares, but I'm hardly into it. It's another 500 plus page book, so I have a lot to get through. But I have no doubt that I'll enjoy it. And in terms of Daughters Mick and Bone trilogy, I think Dreams of Gods and Monsters was my favorite of the trilogy. So I have no doubt that she's going to make an incredible, an incredible conclusion. If you've read Strange the Dreamer, please let me know your thoughts on it. I'd love, love to hear them. I'd also love to know if you've already read Muse of Nightmares and if you think it's a good ending, if you think I would enjoy it. But yeah, leave me your thoughts. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you'll have a fantastic day and happy reading. Bye.